Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. You can ask questions down below this video and I will pick from those uh, for next week's video. If I don't get enough questions one of these weeks, then um, I'll go back and uh, um, try to find some uh, others in the older videos. There's a lot of questions being asked every week right now because I had skipped a little while doing these. So getting lots of questions. It's raining this morning, uh, just dribble dropping, so no big deal, but I probably um, probably don't look my best. I've been planting things uh, in the ground here uh, on a, uh, a cool, cloudy, drizzly morning, um, which I kind of like to do, uh, but uh, um, it's thick out here, <laughs> very, very thick. Okay, so uh, this past week I went up to uh, East Flat Rock and visited Mr. Maple from mrmaple.com, and uh, I shot a video with Matt and his brother Tim in a similar fashion to um, how I shot at Denny Werner's house and, uh, um, and at Buddy Lee's. So that's gonna be, that series of videos is gonna continue. You gonna lay down right there? Okay, that's a good spot. That's a good spot. Uh, that's gonna be a continuing series of videos and I have lots of them lined up, but they're basically just going through some of their favorite plants and introducing us to some plants that I haven't shown uh, on the channel and I'm going to the expert in that particular plant. So. Uh, Tim and his brother have, uh, Tim and Matt have, like, tw they, uh, rotating through their website, 1,200 varieties of Japanese maples, and it's, you know, I'm okay with Japanese maples, but I'm not, definitely, <laughs> would know nothing about 1,200 varieties, so, uh, hopefully that's a, a fun video. His uncle has a walled garden, uh, and some of the B-roll is from that walled garden. I'm going to go back and do a tour of that spot. It's one of the most amazing things. He was a, a, a mason. It's one of the most beautiful things. You guys will see that this week. It's beautiful. And I shot a tour video at a neighbor's house and I had to break it down into two. So that'll be two videos. So that's four of the videos you guys will see this week are finally out of this landscape. I finished the detailed tour video. It ended up being 10 videos, which is honestly just a lot. But there's a lot of varieties here. So I hope you guys got something out of that. There's a playlist I'll link up here in the corner if you're watching on YouTube. And you can go back and see if you've missed any of those 10 videos. They vary wildly in views. So like one has 30,000 and one has 8,000. So I know a lot of you have missed some of them. Um, so anyway, there's 10 videos in that playlist. So let's get started on questions. Uh, somebody has a ruby laura petalum um, that uh, is green on the interior and purple on the outside. Wanted to know if that was normal or if it was in too much shade. Yes, you can have your laura petalum in too much shade and lose some of the coloration, but you won't have any of the purple uh, at that point. Ruby actually has green in the interior and, and the purple on the outside, and it's actually was, I think it was picked for that reason, because the green, um, I think that may be where the ruby name comes from, but it has that two-tone appearance uh, during the uh, growing season where it's green in the middle and purple on the outside. So that's pretty normal with ruby. If the new growth wasn't as purple as you, think it should be, then maybe that's in too much shade because they do prefer uh, my Laura petal I'm here getting you know, at least six hours of direct sun or so before they uh, are in any kind of shade. And that, that's enough to keep them purple. They would probably appreciate even a little more than that. Okay, um, just in general, make sure if you ask a question about a plant recommendation that you're including your plant growing zone because um, I can't really answer a question if I don't know where you uh, are in the country. So zone five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, you can go to the, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the USDA has a horticultural zone map. You can find yourself on that, find out what zone you're in and make sure you include that uh, in the question. Um, so I can make recommendations for something that's cold hardy uh, in your area. Um, if I pick that question, uh, somebody um, asked about uh, pruning a gardenia and they're in Florida and uh, wanted to know um, when they could do it. I think any time uh, between its first flowering in the spring and now in Florida, you could probably prune it. Uh, for me, I'm probably done pruning gardenias at this point. I would have probably pruned them between April and the end of June or so. Um, gardenias are pretty good about setting new buds the following spring and blooming on new growth. The reason I'm actually on a gardenia here in zone seven, not pruning it this late, is just because I don't want it putting on new growth as the cold comes, because it's actually, it's marginal here for cold. And so I'm not so much thinking about flowers on it, uh, whether I'm gonna have flowers next year, it's more about uh, cold hardiness. So, but down in Florida, I think right through about now, if you wanted to do a hard pruning on it, you could. Um, I wouldn't wait until, I wouldn't wait much later than this. Um, but I think you'd be fine in Florida. 
somebody, okay, so somebody bought, I mean, I got this version of question several times where people are buying things right now because they're on sale or whatever. Uh, in the past, I've talked about perennials, herbaceous perennials. I really don't like to plant in the fall all that much, except for super hardy things. So if it's hostas, daylilies, things that you know or you can, run, you can park your car on top of and not kill, uh, go for it. But marginal perennials, things that are a little tricky, um, you know, coming back, you're on, the, you're on the margins of where they come back, like a salvia that's only hardy in the zone seven, and you're in zone seven. I don't like to plant those things in the fall, although fall is a great time to be planting things that are hardy. Um, but things that are marginal, I don't really like to plant them then. And uh, so as people are buying things, it's still early August, I'm putting things in the ground. I'm not going to, this consideration isn't really until September or October. Um, I, I would go ahead and put them in the ground. I'm this way with grasses too. I don't like to plant ornamental grasses in the fall. All of my old landscape jobs, because I was guaranteeing plants um, after we had planted them, uh, you kind of learn you know, what's gonna, what you're going to get calls back on. And uh, ornamental grasses were always kind of tough. If I planted a lot of semi-dormant or dormant grasses in October, November, December, um, we had a hard time with them coming back the following spring. They just stay so wet in the wintertime and rot. Uh, I don't put any root growth on or anything during that uh, winter. Like your shrubs will put on root growth during the uh, winter here in my area. The grasses just rot and die. Not all, but some do or they come back less vigorous than they would have. So if you bought grasses now, I go ahead and put them in the ground, like thing, grasses that die back to the ground, miscanthus, um, whatever it is. Um, but as we get toward October or so, that's when I stop. I would hold those things over the winter in the container. They're better off in the container being protected than they are going in the ground. So that's my only planting rules, marginal perennials and grasses that go dormant uh, in the fall. I, I just don't like to plant them. Everything else, I'll stick them in the ground. Um, and it's a great time to be sticking them in the ground. But August, put them in anyway, put them in. They got plenty of time to get established before the winter. Okay, um, some, lots of people pointing out powdery mildew um, on things. And this is just, I mean, here in Raleigh where I'm at, it's humid every day. And, and things that get powdery mildew, this is kind of the peak time that they're gonna have mildew. My uh, binary zinnias out front are covered in powdery mildew. Uh, but I have a plan for those. Um, so, you know, I know my larger growing zinnias are going to be very rough looking by August every year. And I actually underplanted those with lantana. So I planted lantana and then I planted my binneries. My binneries came up, you know, if you guys go back the first video and that tour video, they're this tall out there. They're beautiful. They're just beautiful. But they're declining rapidly. They're going to come out and then that lantana is going to fill that bed in in August and September. So I actually had a plan for those. My perfusion zinnias, some of the other newer varieties of zinnias, are very mildew resistant. The rain is picking up. <laughs> are very mildew resistant. So look for that on the tags or when you're shopping. If you have mildew issues, if you don't want to do what I did and make this grand plan for, you know, dealing with a plant that I know is going to get mildew and look terrible, then buy ones that are listed for mildew resistance. And that, and that could include cucumbers and squash and zucchini. You know, look, at, look for mildew resistance as you're shopping. This might actually get heavy enough that I'm not going to be able to continue with this right in a second. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, somebody has a wet area and they need shrub recommendations. Yeah, I'm going to stop for just a minute. The rain has slowed back down. And now, we have a different, uh, now we have a different backdrop. Uh, next up, um, somebody asked me for plants to go in a wet uh, area. Um, I would lean on native plants. I've said this in the past. If you have really difficult places, uh, I kind of lean on native plants. So if you're were in my area, I might look for dwarf wax myrtle, um, Elysium, uh, Yopon hollies. Um, it, was, it was in a shady space, so I'm naming things that would work well, work well in, the, uh, in the shade. Here's the thing though. If you go take a plant, even a plant that will grow in kind of wetter areas and you just toss it in there, a lot of times they can struggle. So I would mound them up uh, and treat them um, as if they don't like uh, wet feet all that much and get the uh, root flare up above, you know, up above the grade just a little bit. So when you plant them, leave a couple inches of the pot out of the, of the soil out of the, uh, above the grade and just pull your mulch and soil up to the edge of them. And, uh, uh, but even things that like wet feet don't necessarily want to be planted in the mud, um, uh, weirdly enough. They'll get used to it uh, and adapt to it 
but they don't like to go from a nursery setting where they weren't in those types of conditions and then just be stuck right in there. Um, okay, let's see. Um, somebody, this is a pretty good question. Um, somebody asked me, when is a plant established? People always say that, water it regularly until it's established, water it. For me, it's gonna be when I see a plant um, is really putting on uh, kind of a normal amount of growth uh, that, it, that I would expect from it. So if I put a plant in, in the first fall, the next spring, it's probably gonna grow an inch or two and that's gonna be about it. So that's kind of gonna not be its normal growth year to year. So I know most of that year I'm probably taking care of it. Once I, once I see it flush out one spring and it's you know, really growing vigorously, I, I know at that point it's pretty much anchored itself in. So sometimes, you know, gosh, I've seen plants be 10 years in the ground and people still, you know, they just have never, they were probably poorly planted originally or just not the right plant for that spot. The soil's too compact, whatever, where they just don't. <laughs> and then I've seen most of the things in this landscape because I used the com I put, because I put that layer of compost and wood chips down have really taken off very quickly, uh, have anchored themselves in. And other than the flowering things, uh, most of the shrubs and trees I've already backed off and I've only been here for 18 months and most of this stuff's been in the ground less than a year. Uh, but uh, that's where I'm at uh, at this point. But I'm, 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 I'm basing it on the fact that I can just see how vigorous and you know, healthy they are um, and uh, that they've adapted to that area very quickly uh, and that they're liking it. If they're just sitting there like this and barely putting on any growth or anything like that, they probably still need attention from you or need to be replanted. I mean, frequently, if something sits there like that for 18, 24 months, um, I've got some acanthus over here hasn't put on really any growth since I bought it, it's gonna to go to a new spot. I, I assume that either I planted it too deep or I've put it in too much shade or put it in too much sun. I've done, some, I've done something incorrectly. I'm gonna plant it to a different spot and see what happens there. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody asked me about where can they buy seeds. I'm gonna do my, uh, what I've, I got two videos coming on what I'm purchasing right now. One is my uh, bulbs that I've ordered video um and the other is going to be um seeds and i've ordered so far i've ordered seeds from johnny seeds i've ordered seed from park seed and i've ordered seed from baker creek that's the three places so far i probably have to go a little bit deeper because there's a few things that i'm missing but i'm going to go through all the seed uh, that i've ordered i'm doing a lot i mean a lot of my annuals and some perennials next year from seed and of course my entire vegetable garden i do every year from um pretty much 100 percent seed i rarely buy uh, rarely buy plants on anything for the vegetable garden, but um, you guys will see that video in the next couple weeks. My Johnny seed order and my Park seed order have come in. My Baker Creek seed order has not. If there are things you know you want, I'd get on top of this because I think that there's been an ongoing shortage of seeds. I've actually had a hard time finding the particular beets that I want. Beets produce a ton of seeds, so normally there's plenty of beet seeds, but um, it's just a shortage of everything uh, in this business right now. Um, but that, again, there is a there's a video coming on that. They specifically asked about coleus, and I don't do coleus from seed. Um, and the reason for it is um, I can get them to germinate. They take a long time for me because I'm not in a greenhouse situation, and it's usually about August before my coleus from seed really look good. And that's the reason I don't do them um, from seed. Somebody's gonna comment down below, coleus the easiest thing in the world to do from seed. Come on, man, what's wrong with you? You're the worst gardener ever. Um, and I'm sure somebody has a great technique for growing coleus from seed. I get them to germinate, and then they're just so slow to develop um, that, again, I find buying them in six. I can usually find coleus in six packs. If I have to, I'll buy them in little three or four inch pots, and they just hit the ground running. They've got a bigger established root system on them. They were in a greenhouse all winter from, from the grower. And so, but I do more things from seed than probably almost anyone watching as a percentage of this landscape. So. Um, but coleus, if you can find them in six packs or whatever, I would buy them uh, and, uh, and concentrate your energy on your seeds onto other, other things. Again, gonna be 10 comments down below about how coleus is the easiest thing ever. Um, and it is easy, it's just slow. Okay, um, for me. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody asked about how long they can keep plants in the grower pots that they bought them in. Uh, typically speaking, if you're buying something from a box store or a garden center, uh, it was probably just finished, you know, at the time that they got it uh, from the grower. So I think you can probably get another season out of most things. You're going to have to refertilize them. The way this works is um, 
grower puts a loripedalum, like this purple plant behind me. They put a loripedalum in a container. They know it takes uh, about eight months from a one gallon into a three gallon to finish it and put it in the Lowe's or Home Depot or the garden center or wherever. They're putting a six to eight month fertilizer on that plant. So that the fertilizer is literally running out uh, as, it's reach, um, uh, as it's reaching its destination. And so keep that in mind that, uh, that uh, you'll need to refertilize them. And sometimes you maybe need to do a little pruning on them because they get so big in a container that they're root bound and you're having to water them too much. I do a little bit of a haircut, fertilize them lightly with plant tone or something like that. Just a small amount of fertilizer, not enough to really get them growing, but um, and then you can keep them, keep them through this first winter and next spring probably with no problem in the same pot. Uh, but that is the thing. I, we have very specific fertilizers in the nursery business. I had three to four month fertilizers. Like if I had something that was close to being finished, but it just needed a little extra, we put a two to three month fertilizer on it. If it was something that just went from a one gallon to a three gallon and we knew it takes a full growing season, we'd put a nine to 10 month fertilizer on it. So we were putting a very specific fertilizer on it that ran out the day it was kind of um, at the customer's house, um, just for, mo mo you know, for mo money wise. Okay, somebody's asked me about music that I have on the videos. Um, I use Epidemic Sound uh, for my um, music selection. It's a service I pay for. I was using the free music on, on Google. Um, there is, Google offers free music on, on YouTube. It's, it's, you know, there's okay selections on there, but uh, I have found Epidemic Sound to have great music. So my music quality on the videos is better because it's professional music that I'm, that I'm paying a monthly subscription fee to Epidemic Sound for, which is a re it's actually pretty reasonable. Um, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not too bad and there's great music selections on it. Uh, let's see, um, somebody asked me about moving a dahlia. I think it's, I would not move a dahlia right now. I think I'd probably wait uh, until it started breaking the ground in the spring, probably to do it at this point. Maybe somebody else would, but they're in zone seven and it's marginal here in our area. So I probably at this point in August overwinter it in the ground. When it breaks ground next spring, that would be the time to dig that tuber up. You could probably divide it at the same time um, if you wanted to. Uh, somebody asked me about getting rid of nut sedge in the garden. This is another one of those uh, uh, internet ones. I mean, there are specific sprays I think it's called sledgehammer or something that's uh, a chemical that's for uh, nut sedge. And you guys know I spray pretty much nothing. But in the, in the world we live in, because when you, when, okay, so when you pull a nut sedge plant, you wake up dormant um, roots uh, and you get new plants, okay? So in the world on the internet, you should never pull nut sedge. Don't pull nut sedge. You're going to get more nut sedge. But you've weakened it. Okay, so pull your nut sedge and then, but what you need to know is that almost immediately more nut sedge is going to come up. And if you keep pulling it, you will eventually weaken it and it will die and it will, won't go away. Everybody's always going to have nut sedge. There's no going away for these weeds, for crabgrass or for poana or for nut sedge or any of the other weeds you have. You're never going to make them go away. But um, it's another one of those internet is, it's not an internet is broken things, but it's an internet is exaggerated. Uh, thing. Pull the dang nut sedge um, and then a week or two later make sure you're going back to those same places and pull it again. It's an easy weed to pull. Uh, interestingly it comes up by the root but what what happens is it has little root nodules and those become the new growth and so when you break it off you get three in the place of one but you weakened it and so when those three pieces come up if you'll pull those quickly you'll get less and less in that space. It doesn't mean that there's other nut sedge seeded around your yard that's gonna to continue to bug you, but uh, it's possible to lessen it um, through pulling it, uh, even though the internet is whatever, is gonna tell you, no, 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 go get a chemical. Okay, um, somebody's real charmer, uh, Leucanthemum is flopping. I just cut mine back. Um, once they start to uh, slow down and fade, mine just got cut back to the ground. And so uh, don't worry about that, it's kind of normal. Locanthemum get to a certain, they just look so great. <laughs> and then especially ones that are a couple years old because they get so crowded. They look so great, uh, but boom, off with their heads. I just go right to about, down to about two or three inches with these over here. They're already putting on new growth. I may actually see a few flowers out of those uh, being that it's only August 1st. Um, uh, but that's how I'm, I'm hard on them. I'm not going to, you know, 
stake them up or anything like that. They just boom off with their heads down to about three inches tall. You'll see all kinds of new growth down at the base. Within a week, you'll see new growth coming on them. Um, uh, so last one for this week. Um, again, you guys ask questions down below and I'll pick, pick from them um, each week. This will be the last one for this week. Somebody bought a clethora and it was doing that wilting thing and so they did some pruning on it and wanted to know if it would still bloom this year. No, it's probably not gonna bloom this year, but you did the right thing protecting the plant. You know, putting the long-term health of the plant ahead of trying to get three flowers on something uh, in the first season in the ground is always a good idea. So if something is, you know, wilting every afternoon, I don't care what it is. If it's something that you've newly planted and you're trying to protect three blooms but the plant is just really hurting for it, um, I think that's not a great idea. Cut the flowers off and the plant will thank you for it next year. The plant will reward you next year for doing that. And so I think you did the right thing on your clethora, but no, you probably won't see any more flowers this year. Uh, maybe one, who knows. Thank you guys for following along with the videos. Again, I think I got a super interesting video shot for this uh, upcoming week and uh, see you next Sunday.